my grandma used to say, now in polite society, you never talk about politics or religion. So I think what we might do is break all the rules and talk about politics and religion. Philip Jensen, welcome to the program. <laughs> Thank you very much. Poor old grandma. I apologise, grandma. So. Yes, you should. <laughs> yes. Let's start by talking about democracy. Okay. Uh, Churchill said democracy was the least worst system in the world. Talk to me about democracy. I think Churchill was right. Uh, I don't think it's, a, it's necessarily a good system. Uh, it's impossible to invent a fair voting system. Um, it, it's the tyranny of the majority over the minority. If you're a fixed minority, then you are always in opposition. Uh, the electorate, you know, I'm always in blue ribbon electorates, either blue ribbon left or blue. So but individual vote, votes don't count? It doesn't count particularly, yeah. no. Uh, and so you can't actually, but it still, it, it calls each side of parliament or each government to account every three or four years. And that's a good thing because long term people need to be held to account, especially so, so with power. Being in a democracy is something Christians should celebrate, should be pleased about, should be well, it's part a great, of. It's a great gift yep. to us, really. It's a, it's a great benefit to us. We would obey the government even if we're not in a democracy. Right. Because Acts 13, uh, Romans 13 tells us to obey the government, uh, as does 1 Peter chapter 2. And the government they're obeying there was the Roman emperor. And so you've got to honour the emperor. So uh, the fact that you get a choice of government, the fact that you can vote uh, and that you can remove an unsatisfactory government, that is an enormous privilege given to us, but not one that is specifically Christian. Mind you, if Paul could add a footnote to Romans 13 for us, he, he, and he should, he'd probably say, and for you people in democracies, you've got no excuse. Absolutely you really no excuse. Have to. You, you put them in there. Yeah. And in Australia, even more so because we got compulsory voting. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, compulsory voting is a good thing because it, uh, it stops the extremists taking over the country. It forces people have to get 50% of the community somewhere along the line by the preferential system saying, I'll accept him as the leader. If that's some... been the case, you can't complain about what they do. The other thing is we end up with parliaments where it's not monocultural. They're not everyone taking one line. You've got one mob are going to argue for something, the other mob are going to argue for the opposite. So sooner or later, your voice will be heard somewhere along the line. Well, it can be, yes. Although, if you hold an extreme view, it, it's not held easily in our system. But a strange thing about democracy is that it doesn't really work unless you've got a two-party system. If you've yes, got ten yes. parties, you spend so much time discussing who's going to co co coalesce <laughs> with whom Form a coalition with Form whom? Form a coalition with whom? But uh, you actually can't get stable government. Stable government requires the two-party system, although, strangely, the two-party system is not part of the Constitution. R right. No, 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 it's not mentioned. But we still have a government and we still have a, a loyal opposition. I should mention, by the way, we're actually recording this chat in the middle of an Australian federal election campaign in the year 2010. So if you're looking at it some other time, and we, we end up making some topical references that don't make sense, that's why. If you're looking at it overseas, you should study Australian politics more closely and you'll understand all of this more. Uh, but there is a loyal opposition as well as a government. Yes, and that loyal opposition idea, I think actually, I, I don't know the history of it, but it seems to me it comes out of a Christian understanding. That is, we obey the government, whoever is the rightful government, and therefore we will be loyal to a government even when we're opposed to it. But you look in the histories of the world and the histories of cultures, uh, which have, especially ones not directly affected by the Bible, the leader of the opposition doesn't last long. No, no. Fidel Castro never had a, a, no. a loyal opposition. <laughs> no, he had a locked up opposition no, yes. or a dead opposition. <laughs> and whereas we have a system where not only do we have a leader of the opposition, but we pay him extra money to lead the opposition right. against the government. Now that's a an enormously civilised idea, uh, a really helpful idea, but it's a very Christian way of, of operating. I can oppose the government, Romans 13, I can oppose the government, but still be loyal, but still be to, loyal to the nation the and the it. government. And when the government makes its decision, even though I've argued against it, I pay the taxes, I, I will do what the government says, because they are the government and I'm not. And that idea of loyal opposition, I think is a terrific way of, of capturing what a Christian understanding of government would be about. 
And you, you will get uh, politicians who will say, well, I favour this particular policy, but I accept the verdict of the people. What they yes. wanted was the other. That's, that's, that's what I acknowledge and recognise and I'm going to be loyal to. Yes, although that's said more than done. <laughs> oh. <laughs> they're politicians. Yes, Come on, Philip. Right. They're politicians. Well, there are certain subjects on which the politicians have, both sides have chosen to ignore what the majority of Australians want. So on capital punishment, for example, the, each poll shows us the majority of Australians want capital punishment, but no political party will offer it to that. We get a lot of politics which is a poll driven these days, it's opinion yes. poll driven. I mean, is, what is the role of the politicians? Are they there to lead? Are they there to reflect us? In a democracy, what are they supposed to do? Well, you could do it different ways. I mean, there's, there's, it's not written what they are supposed to do in a sense, but we are electing people to make decisions. Now, the, the character and quality of the people that we elect will determine the kinds of decisions they will, that they will make. If their decisions are too far away from us, then they stand a great chance of being kicked out at the next election. So they keep, uh, they keep an ear to the ground as to what the public want, so as to make sure they don't go too far out ahead of the public or lag too far behind them. But in the end, they are making the decisions, not the public. So whenever a parliamentary decision is made, we don't suddenly all go on the, on the, on the web and press <laughs> yes or no. They make the decisions on the best evidence that is available and we will accept their decisions, which means we trust them. Okay. Think about the way we as Christians respond to politics. I mean, uh, we know it's a fallen world and it's a sinful world, so we shouldn't be disappointed when things go wrong, when policies don't work, when politicians don't keep their promises. We should expect that sort of thing. Yes, but it's also, it's a corporate activity. And so we, we, idealism doesn't ultimately work in politics. I have my ideals, you have your ideals. Politics is the art of of you and I so compromising our ideals as to achieve some common outcome that we can both live with and accept. Neither of us gets exactly what we want, but we can get something that holds us together and produces something better. So when we see politicians having to do deals, and that's politics. It's, it's not an evil thing, that's just the give and take of a society working together for hopefully the best ideals that can be produced, sometimes the lowest common denominator of ideals that are produced. And what about Christians involved in the process? Christians becoming members of political parties, being involved in campaigns and handing out literature, becoming members of parliament. Does that work with our Christian faith? Well, it's a good thing and it's a right thing. Uh, some of us find it easier than others. Um, uh, I find it hard to align myself with either of the major political parties here in Australia, so it's easier for me to sit cross-benched. But if you sit in the cross-benches, you never get anything done. You, you can't actually rule the country. You can be high in your moral superiority that you haven't compromised, but you actually don't achieve anything particularly. Um, to achieve changes in society, we need people of good character and goodwill, good mind, good understanding to serve and the way to serve is through political parties. And so uh, Christians have a contribution to make in society and they need to make it through their political parties. And I think it's a perfectly appropriate, good thing for a Christian to be engaged in that activity for the welfare of other people. What about corporately? Because sometimes there'll be complaints that, you know, this or that church is getting involved or this or that congregation yeah. is getting involved yeah. or this or that minister is getting involved. I mean, is there a role there or is there not? No, I think that's a much more dangerous role in upfront politics. Uh, the, the way the church should influence the, the, uh, the political process is through its members being involved in the political process. When it's institution to institution, church to state, etc., that then opens up a whole range of other problems. Now, it's not to say that we, the church should never say anything politically. Uh, there are some issues it's very important for the church to say politically and it's important for the politicians to hear that it's not just the odd Christian who thinks this, but that is the view of congregational life. But on most of the political issues, or shall I say most of the party political issues, uh, the difference really is a difference of 
of tactics, of technology. How not we get Christian to where we, where we want to go. Yeah, yes. that's right. And not of Christian principle per se. And uh, therefore, as a, a minister of the gospel, I will rarely have ever let people understand who I would vote for or encourage them to vote for this party or that party because we're united in Christ Jesus, which is more important than being a member of the Labor Party or the Liberal Party. And I don't want to alienate the Labor community from Christianity by being a Liberal or the Liberal community by being a Labor person. Um, I think it's legitimate to be a Christian in either camp. Because, and therefore, as a church and as a congregation, I want both camps to feel welcome here uh, within congregational life. And uh, there are issues which are issues that you may raise as a church. But it's got to be even-handed issues. It's not got to be the, all the issues on the that side of politics <laughs> right. I'm always attacking. If an individual Christian is interested in politics, and, and I work with people who are obsessed with politics, yes, and actually think yes. politics can solve all the problems in society, we need to be clear about the fact that can't happen. No, that can't be happening. It's been very funny here in Australia too to see the media hoisted on its own petard because the great political debate of this election had to be postponed because there was a media show that was more important, <laughs> yes. namely... Masterchef. Masterchef. So you yes. have a cooking show which is more important to the community than the Prime Minister and Leader of the Opposition having a debate about who to vote. For. Yes. But most of the people in the media would have preferred the debate. Yes, yes. Because they're all fanatics on the, on, on the politics. Yeah. <laughs> Journalists, by and large, are political addicts. They're political yes. obsessives. They're political tragics. They're and tragic, and aren't someone they? said to me, what part of the community is interested in the, the current election campaign we're going through? And I said the Canberra Press Gallery. Yes. I think that's about it. Yes, because yeah, it's a very dull election. Yes. Two people desperately trying to claim the middle ground. This is the beige election. The beige election, yes. And, and they, 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 they're trying to become as small a target as possible to make as few mistakes so as possible. The Canberra Press Gallery is fascinated, no one else is. As individuals, we should have, we have a responsibility, we should be interested. We sometimes think they're a long way from us. You know, the people who are political leaders are, are really significant figures. We have no contact with them. But th there is at least one politician we all have contact with, or could have, and that's our local member. Yes. Uh, there are different political systems and again our media are really not helping us in the slightest in this regard. We don't have a presidential system here in Australia and so we don't directly elect the president. We don't have a president. We don't directly elect the leader of the government. Yeah, we don't elect the prime minister We directly. don't elect the prime minister directly. We elect local members and the local members then elect the Prime Minister and the Speaker of the House and the rest. It came up with, with Kevin Rudd in one yes. way when he, he was refusing to leave office, when his party wanted him to leave office, saying, I was elected to be Prime Minister. Yes. No, he wasn't. He was elected to be the member for Griffith. That's his party it. made him Prime Minister. That's it. That's a very big difference. And But he was sold to the public back in 2007 uh, as if he was the President. As, As if a, he was the Prime Minister to be. Which is partly the, the political party, but it's also partly the, it suits the media to go along that road. Much simpler, to, and simplification is the art of media, isn't it? It's much simpler to have one person against one person than to tell all the community who their local members are and what their local members are about. And especially on the mass media, it has to be simplified down to you're voting for this person or you're voting for that person. Yeah, so it's a Julia Gillard versus a Tony Abbott. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're the potential presidents, they're the potential elected king. Yes, but of course they weren't, as can be seen by the fact that when uh, Kevin fell into unpopularity uh, with the poll, his party removed him. And then people, I, I've had people say to me, you know, I've voted, I've never voted Labor in my life, but I've voted for Kevin Rudd. And the answer was, no, you didn't. You I voted know, for you your didn't. local member. And now they feel very disappointed yes. because Kevin Rudd was removed. So just as he felt he was elected to be the Prime Minister, they felt they were electing the Prime Minister. Which is, which is to fail to understand our system. So understanding our system is an important part yes. of this. In the United States, the Democrats could not remove Barack Obama no matter what he did. No, they couldn't remove and re re replace him with another Democratic no, leader. That's right. That's not how their system. But our system works like that. Yes, and so you've got to understand the power and the importance of your local member. Right. And 
you're never voting for the Prime Minister, you're voting for the local member. The local member is only one of however many members there are, uh, but that one has his say. And, and if there's a, if, and that's the only power you're actually being given. And my, my experience talking to parliamentarians is local, local members are interested in their local constituent. They oh, yes. do their, 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 their local um, surgery, as they call it, when yes. they meet local constituents. And at election time, they'll be in the shopping plaza and that the kind of thing. Politicians I know work very hard in the local areas. So if there's any politician who cares about us as individuals, it's our local member. That's right. Or would be local That's member. That's right. He's the one or she's the one who has to keep the ear to the ground all the time and say, no, we're moving in policy too far away from the electorate. But if we in the electorate do not talk to him, he doesn't know that. OK, so how do we as Christians talk to that person? Well, they're available. In every, every electorate, there's electoral offices, and you can ring up and make an appointment to see your local member. Um, during an election, they really listen to us. <laughs> That's the one time they've got to listen to us. I mean, in one sense, they're talking to us and telling us to vote for them. Right. But in another sense, they are listening carefully to what are the questions that people are asking. So to hold meetings and to invite them to meetings or to go to the meetings where they're wanting to meet the, the local electorate because they want to meet you at this time, and to ask them questions are really important. You don't have to argue with them. You don't even have to tell them your point of view necessarily. Just to ask them, but what are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about that? What are you going to do about such and such? They say, oh, my local people, they're concerned about these issues. Okay. These are the things I'm always being asked about. If we're going to do that, if we're going to ask questions of our local members, what as Christians do we need to focus on? What kinds of areas? I, I think the principal areas rather than the tactical areas, if I can say it like that. That is, a principle is poverty. We as Christians are against poverty. We as Christians want to see poor people cared for properly in our society. Uh, we want to see justice in the dealings with everybody and compassion with those who are in difficulty. But frankly, every politician agrees with that. You, you can't get elected in Australia without agreeing with that. What the politicians disagree about is how to do that. They disagree with the tactics. Some will move down to a more socialistic end of the spectrum. Some will move to a more capitalistic end of the spectrum. But, but they're both are, aiming at the same thing. They're aiming at the same thing. Yes. yes. And so there's, there's not a principal difference. It's a really important issue for Christians, but it's not an issue that is particularly relevant in the election, nor is it particularly relevant in terms of what my local member thinks about it, frankly. Furthermore, as a Christian person, I've got no more expertise in those tactics than, I mean, I'm not an economist, and I'm not sure the economists know how to do it yeah, either. Even frankly. if I was an economist, <laughs> I'd, I'd only have three opinions on my own. As yeah. any, as any opinion. And, you know, I, I, how, however confident I might be, I don't know. I don't know. So I'm, I'm wary of Christians running up the issue that, well, social justice is the highest priority for us, and therefore we should be arguing. I agree it's a very high priority for us, but politically, provided the person's actually interested in justice and interested in the poor and trying to bring compassion and justice together, I really, it's, it's a very private opinion as to whether I think he's using the right tactics or not. Yep. But yep. there are other principal issues that really I, I do need. Okay, we'll, we'll identify those Well, us. they're life and death issues. So they're, they're the issues on, on euthanasia, they're issues on abortion. There's these, these life death issues are really critical. There are the issues of, of, uh, of justice, because justice is a fundamental of the, of the work of government. Again, I don't see the parties being very different on the issue of justice, so I don't pursue that. But another area of life, or of principle where there's huge differences opening up more and more is the issue of family life. And so the questions of de facto marriages, the questions uh, uh, of, uh, uh, well, I was going to say abortion, but that's the life death one, or, or the nature of divorce, or how much people are going to be investing in trying to make marriages work. A another issue of great importance of principle for us is gambling. Uh, gambling's a massive problem. Now, uh, most of the parties go very doggo and very quiet on the subject of gambling because 
They make a lot of money out of it, governments do. Governments make a lot of money out of gambling and they're not going to do anything about it. Even though our society is being crippled by the poker machine industry, uh, which, which politician is going to say anything or do anything about it? Now, if we go and ask questions about, well, what are you going to do about gambling? What are you going right. to do about poker machines? And if enough of us go and say that, then the politicians start to say, well, the people care about this issue. Right. And so that's a worthwhile thing to be raising. So there are certain issues. So it would, it would be worthwhile if I got an appointment with my local member, when, particularly when an election's on, and sat down and said, tell me what you think about euthanasia. That yes. would be worth doing. Yes, and especially as both political parties use the conscience vote on certain issues. And right. they use them on these issues in particular because they know they can't hold their membership in, in in, in agreement and, and the whip can't force everybody on their side to vote the right way on issues like life and death, on issues like abortion. And so it's critical, therefore, what does my member think on those issues? Because I'm voting for the man who is going to vote, or the woman who is going to vote for us having a euthanasia bill or not having a euthanasia bill. And, and that is far, far more important than whether they are Labor Party or Liberal Party. And we need to have done some thinking and some research because they won't let us just ask questions. They'll want to know, they'll be looking for a bit of guidance and feedback from us as a, as a member sure. of the, the community. But I can say, without even saying I'm a Christian, I yeah. don't have to say that, uh, I'm a citizen. Yeah. Uh, I'm a Christian, but I'm a citizen. I can say, I am very concerned about this issue because I don't want us to introduce euthanasia laws. Or yeah. I don't want us to, to make divorce any easier than it is already. Or and so I can express these issues concern me, but it's more important to say, and I'm going to see the other person who's standing as well to find right. out what they think about it, so I'll know how to cast my vote. But at that point, you really have to be a person who's willing to change your vote. Yes, you, if, if I'm spot welded to one party, then what's the point? What's the point? Yeah. And I think you're being spot welded uh, in a sense to the technology of bringing about results rather than to the principles. Yes, right. And the principles actually matter more in the long run. Okay, let me, let me, let me draw some threads together. There, there are three things we need to do. We need understanding and talking and voting. We need to understand how our system really works yes. and understand what it is it's worth talking about as Christians, don't mm -hmm. we? So, so how do we pursue that? How do we make sure I understand what the system is, I understand what matters? How do we pursue enough understanding to do this intelligently and do it well? Well, there are two kinds of people we're talking about here. One is voters, the others are activists. Right. Uh, for the voters, the political system is fairly simple in terms of its basic structure. The Senate elections are very complicated in how, they've, how they count the Senate the Senate vote, that's very difficult. But in terms of the local, uh, in terms of the House of Representatives or the lower house, it is a very simple method by which we vote. And it's compulsory, but you've got to understand it's made of parties and local members. That's who we're voting for, the local member. And if I'm going to, if my vote's going to be worth something, I have to be not super glued to some, some party or some group or some point of view, but I have to say, I'm going to make it count every time by talking to the local member. Yeah knowing what's going on. As a voter. Yes. As a, uh, an activist, someone who has joined a political party, in a sense you are spot welded then onto that party. Yep. But you get your say when it comes to the selection of candidates for the party. And that's where you need to be active. Or in the policy conference that the party has, and you need to be an active there. That's where you need to raise the great principal issues. Yeah. Okay, so we need understanding talking and voting. That's understanding. For talking, we need to talk to our local members and maybe yep. talk to other Christians and say, this is worth doing. And it's worth doing in groups. And sometimes I've been to a couple of meetings, I remember in times gone by, where the local churches got together and invited the two members, who are two people who are standing, to, to come and answer questions for us. Right. And uh, I went to a very interesting one, I remember many years ago, where the lovely Christian man gave terrific Christian answers and the non-Christian man gave really dreadful answers. But as the evening wore on, you realised that the Christian man would be a terrible politician <laughs> because he didn't understand 
the law. He didn't understand the government. He didn't. Yes. Say, whereas the non-Christian man, although he had terrible answers, actually was very. You had to make man. the system work. Yeah. And you had to make the system work. Yeah. And so, the evening was a funny evening because it showed us what was happening, yep. and then you had to make a choice as to how you vote. But at least you're choosing between two real people. Okay, understanding, talking, and voting. We vote in the end based on what we understand in our conversations. And the fact that we're going to get fined if we don't. <laughs> yes, we do that. <laughs> We, we do that too. It's the only country in the world, I think. It might be one or two others, but we are rare in no, this no, world. No, no, there's a tiny handful. We're not the only tiny one. Handful, a tiny handful it? who have compulsory voting. And compulsory yeah. democracy is not a bad thing. It seems to work for us, doesn't it? Yeah, well, it certainly means that weird minority parties don't win. Yes. Although, in the upper house, they can control power. Okay. But we, we go to vote, and it means you don't walk into the booth on the day and donkey vote or say it doesn't matter? Well, it's not responsible citizenship to do that. Uh, on the other hand, it is true God is sovereign and he will appoint in authority whomever he wishes. But it'd be nice if we were, we were cooperating with God in the process. Well, it's, it's a question of how responsible should a Christian or must a Christian be. Um, our responsibility primarily is to pray. And so 1 Timothy chapter 2 says that we've got to pray for those in authority over us. By virtue of the fact that we're praying for them, it would seem to me a little strange that we would then not take any opportunity to exercise a considered vote in the process of who, who gets elected or not. If we, though, were in a government which we didn't get that choice, we'd still need to pray for them. So the Bible doesn't tell us you must vote. But it does tell us we must pray. It does tell us we must pray. Yep. And if we're praying for these people and are given a vote, well, then I take it that we would use our vote sensibly. So there you have four points, four things you need to do. They, they need to be understanding, talking, voting and praying. And we need to, we need to actually be actively doing that, don't we? Yes. In some ways, praying is the first one. Right. So in the, your top order. Of list, top yes. of the list. But I mean, unless you understand, you can't pray. You don't know what you're praying for. But, right. but prayer is commanded by God that we should be concerned to pray for those in government over us, and that we might live a peaceful, quiet life, which is Australia, actually. Because of our system of compulsory voting, because of our system of preferential, we do live a very quiet, stable life. Political radicalism is a dangerous thing. Which is, and that, that's good for Australia. We don't have a lot of that. So there you are. Understanding, talking, uh, voting and praying, but you actually do it the other way. Praying, understanding, talking, voting. And maybe talking in your prayer and Bible study group could be a good idea as well. Philip Jensen, thank you for your company Pleasure, once again. Phil. And thank you for your company on The Chaplain.